Hello and welcome to this Union Solidarity International web conference with Anne Petterford. Anne is probably best known for the work she did with the Jubilee 2000 campaign and other work that she's done on the cancellation of debt for uh, third world countries. And thank you for joining us today. Pleasure. Um, Wonderful to be here. And the, the thing that, that strikes us is you've done a lot to work with debt in, in the third world and it now seems that that problem has moved into the first world and we have a sovereign debt crisis that's affecting the whole economy. So what can we learn from that and, and uh, where does that leave us? Well, that's, that's the point. I mean, what happened was in the 80s and the 90s, I was really very deeply concerned about the impact of sovereign debt on the ability of poor countries, mainly in Africa and Latin America and some in Asia, um, to recover from crisis. And of course, by being debtors, they became effectively enslaved to the international financial institutions, the crediting institutions, and credit to governments. And so the work was about how to, to free them up, if you like, to become more independent, what economists call policy autonomy. Um, and that ended at the end of 2000. And when I looked up, I spent three years at the New Economics Foundation after that. And when I looked up from my desk, so that I saw that the debts owed by these poor countries were as nothing compared to the enormous private and public, but mainly private debt mountain that was being built up in American economies, primarily, actually. Um, I underestimated the impact on, for example, Europe, where we're on the whole more frugal and they were not quite so in love with the Anglo-American idea of living on borrowed and borrowed time. Um, but it was clear to me back in 2003 that there was going to be a very severe financial crisis. I just didn't know quite when. And then in 2006, I wrote a book, The Coming, which the publisher called by the cheerful title of The Coming First World Debt Crisis. Because by then I was really quite desperate. I was, I could see that this thing was not going to last. I could see that many others realized that and were hedging their bets. Whereas my friends were going out and buying houses and borrowing like there were no tomorrow. And I just was so fearful for them. And yet back in 2006, the book went absolutely nowhere, of course, and was ignored. Um, then in... Uh, August 2007, the dam broke, and we had the credit crunch. So since then, I've had a fair amount of credit for my work, which is good. Um, but what it means is that whereas the um, poor countries had some resolution to their foreign public debt, the debt owed by their sovereign governments, what we haven't had in the West is a resolution of the private domestic financial crisis that we're all facing. So Britain is the most heavily indebted country in the world, according to McKinsey, who'd done a survey of private debt across the world. We're even debted than the Japanese, more indebted than the Irish, and more indebted than the Americans as, as a private sector. And that's the debts, the banks are the big problem. They have enormous debts and liabilities, which is why they, they can't lend right now. It's also corporate debt. There's been much talk about corporations hoarding cash. The reason they're hoarding cash is that they have outstanding debts, and they are really, really worried because they don't have customers coming through them, and they therefore have to hang on to their cash in case the banks demand repayment in a very short time. And then there's individuals who've got you know, credit card debt, which, by the way, fell after the crisis here in Britain, but is now rising again. Uh, above all, they've got mortgage, and, and for some very strange reason, largely to do with Russian oligarchs, um, money is pouring into Britain and into London, house prices up, but only until interest rates rise, and then I think many, many people with mortgage debts in Britain will lose out. So where we are at the moment is that this big overhang of private debt, which is a real problem, has not been addressed. In fact, the government is obsessed with this tiny, what I regard as a really relatively small debt, which is the public debt. Public debt is about, for Britain, is about 67% of GDP. Private debt 
is to 600 percent of GDP. The government's turning a blind eye to that, not doing anything about it. Um, but obsessed by, because we're in political, of course, public debt. Um, in America, they have a better understanding of the department. They have a better understanding of the problem of private debt, and they have been trying to deleverage it. And that's been done quite by, for example, forcing people to, for, to be foreclosed upon to lose their homes, hand over the keys, because they can't pay back the mortgage, the bank takes back and tries to sell it on. And so you see a dip in the private debt levels of the American, which actually is beginning to rise again now. So they, they are attempting to look at this private interest. We're not doing anything at all like that. Um, and my second point is this, there's two ways to deal with the debt. I think that by now it's probably my tenth one. Uh, there's two to deal with private debt, two fundamental ways. The first way is to say, this is going to be mortgage, this company will never be able to pay it back, business is too bad, it, it's, just, it's just a zombie company, we have the phenomenon of zombie corporations, and therefore we're going to have to write it off. So the bankruptcy process, let's go to the courts, let's manage this bank, let's write it off. That's one way with the debt. The other way is to deal with the debt, to generate income, so that it can be paid back. Um, and the best way to generate income, as anybody who's ever, is to create jobs. That way, Mrs. Jones can pay back her mortgage if she's got an income. That could save the banks. And the companies who are holding cash and who are in difficulty, who are zombie companies, will begin, she'll start shopping with them. Activity will begin. That'll clean up the balance sheets and restore us to normal. Not back to normal. But the government, the European governments, the IMF, you know, uh, the US, these institutions want to address that issue. And so we are in this zombie-like state at the moment. Um, when we know that the answer to our crisis is on the one hand bankruptcy, and that's not a nice thing. Uh, on the other hand, we have to grab this issue and understand it better. Because the answer to the current crisis is to create jobs which will make income for private, the private sector, but also generate tax revenues, pay down the public sector's debt. Also. And it's not the answer that the ideologues in governments across Europe are willing to hear. Sorry if that went on for a bit too long. Um, not at all. That was absolutely perfect. And it sounds like we're in a difficult position because the problem is being misdiagnosed in Europe uh, for ideological reasons. Um, and, you know, you, you're suggesting the twofold solution. One is the one I think Michael Hudson's done a lot of work on the call for a, a mass uh, debt jubilee or debt write down. Um, so, so one is the sense that we need to, as much as possible, go bankrupt or cancel the debt or um, essentially get rid of it and the other is that we need to create employment um, and how governments in Europe and particularly in the UK are wedded to the idea of the private sector is going to create this employment it doesn't seem to be happening so how do we yeah. create employment um, how do we pay for it and what kind of employment should it be what kind of job should be created and the reason I ask that question is because I know that you have done work on the Green New Deal, for example, um, which I'm, cur I'm curious yeah. to know what that is and what it would look like. Right. Well, yes. Um, uh, well, there's several big questions in there. And uh, first of all, I want to say this, that um, the British public and the European public have been befuddled by politicians who have argued that the public uh, balance sheet, the public deficit, the public debt is pretty much like your own credit card debt. And those are the literal words. He said to the October 20th and Tory party conference, you know, the government's deficit, your credit card, he said. Um, and the credit and the, the public have swallowed that on the whole, but they're beginning to change their minds. They're beginning to understand, thanks to the work of lots of good people, Michael Hudson, 
that actually no, uh, the public budget is not at all like my budget. I think it's really important for us to get that into our heads. Um, you and I can increase our income, we can cut back on our spending, and we can balance our books. We can, we can decide to take in a lodger to increase our income, we can decide not to have a summer holiday, we can manage our budget down again. The government cannot do that. The government's budget and its deficit, its overdraft if you like, is entirely dependent on what the whole of the economy does. You and I can balance our budgets even if the rest of the economy doesn't do the same. Now, of course, if everybody balanced their budgets simultaneously, of course, that would have an impact on the economy. Because as individuals, what we do is not at all like what the government does. So I just want us to get that into our heads. The government's budget is totally determined about by, by the cake uh, that it's part of. When the cake gets bigger, uh, the budget falls. When the cake shrinks, the budget rises. The budget gets bigger as a, of the whole economy. It's not, it's not rocket science. I was thrilled the other day on Question Time. Um, David Dimbleby was in the chair and a Tory said, oh, you know, the, the budget is just like your household budget. We've got to balance it. And, he's, and he, David Dimbleby said, no, no, that's not true, is it? We all know that's not the case. Well, if David Dimble be given, then the rest of us should get it too. So that's one point. The second point is, where do we get the money from? Well, my answer, to, and I'm very glad to see that Adair Turner last year, last week, and uh, Mark in today's Financial Times are promoting Adair. Um, and it's not new, what is the Bank of England, 1694. And my idea is that we can't raise money through taxation because right now um, everybody is over indebted already. The economy is in a zombie-like state. Everyone is lacking confidence um, and fearful. The tax people, when their incomes are falling in real terms, which is what is happening to anybody who's a wage earner or a salary earner, and when, to be honest, Come making the profits and many are getting bust. Um, and when banks are in deep, deep doo doo because they have too much debt, in those circumstances, taxing is not the answer to raise them to finance government public infrastructure expenditure. The Bank of England is where we should take the money from. Now, this is considered anathema by um, orthodox economists. But whenever we've had to fight a war or handle a crisis, the Bank of England is obliged from 1694 when William II needed money because he'd run out of cash wars and whatever. The Bank of England was set up in order to finance that. And, and that's a good thing. I want to stress that. It's a wonderful to live in a society which has a proper institution, a, a Bank of England, a, a Bank of England, an institution, if you like the leader and institutional framework for a banking system. Go to Africa, to many countries in Africa, they don't have a proper banking system. Go to Nigeria and people don't use credit cards. There isn't trust in the banking, it's not enforced by the legal system. The criminal justice system doesn't up a contract in Nigeria, say. So in that case, they don't have a proper functioning bank system and they walk around either with dollar bills in a plastic bag or they have naira, billions of naira sometimes in a hundred or so, I say that, thousands of naira in a, in a plastic bag. That means it's very hard for them to create in their country and, and to develop. But we here in Britain have such, an, have such a system. What happens that's just broke, is that the Bank of England, the Federal Reserve, the Bank of Japan, and the European Central Bank have generated something like, at an estimate provided by the Bank of England, it was $16 trillion out of, out of nowhere. Now, that's a wonderful feature of a banking system. It means that when you have a bank, it can be found. The real problem is, and, and can I just mention here that Ben Bernanke did an interview 
in 2009, soon after he'd given $160 billion, I think it was, to A, to bail them out. And that isn't even a bank. shouldn't even be, if you like, registered states. And, and the journalist said to him, where did you get the money from? Was it from taxation? And he said, no, 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 no. He said, we have inside the Federal Reserve called a computer. And we enter a number into the computer and we charge it to AIG's account. And that's what happens. The Bank of England provides funding to the banking system. Or every time the, the private bank does them, they don't have the money in the bank. What they have is your collateral, your promise to read over a period of time, and the rate of interest that you're going to repay at. That's all they have. And they better judge your collateral is worth it. Many of them didn't take the trouble, of course. But that's all they need in order to plonk into your bank via the bank money system the three hundred thousand pounds for a new loan. So, so this is a magic which is wonderful if it's if it's managed and regulated properly. So I've argued for a very long time now. And by the way, I have a paper up on Prime Economics called "Creating Money." out of thin air, which I recommend your listeners should look at. It's a problem, but I think it's written in such a way that most people will be able is, to understand. Is this um, the idea that we know as uh, chartalism, the, 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 the power of the state to, to create money because of uh, its status, I suppose? Um, yes, because it's it's got the back, if you like, of a of a central bank and a government which has the ability to collect taxes. You see, it's about creating money out of thin air. Is that that's, it's not the creation of money that's the issue. Uh -huh. That, as I say, can be done by entering a number into a computer and depositing some money in it. The real issue is how is the money spent? spent. If it's spent on speculation, on gambling out there in the buying Brazilian reals or meddling in the commodity markets betting that, you know, the price of copper will go up by half a cent or down by three cents. That kind of speculative activity might earn you returns, but it also might not. But if you insist in something really sound, like building a railway, which employs people, which employs engines, um, which has a useful purpose, which is going to generate income, then the money gets paid back. Mm -hmm. Because it's been spent in a way that generates income. So it's not the story of the bank creating money out of thin air. It's a great story because most people don't know that that's how it happens. But actually it's only one tiny part of the story. The big of is what, how is the money spent mm -hmm. and does it generate sound income? And furthermore, what is the price of that money? Mm -hmm. if, it's, if its interest rate is 8 or less, it's probably unlikely to ever be repaid. And the cost of repayment is very high because most companies make a profit on about 50% a year, on average, over time. Right? Sometimes, like Barclays yesterday, make 26%. But over history, historic time, that's, that's a bizarre rate of profit. If interest rates are higher than 3%, you make it harder to generate the income needed to repay the loan. So if Keynes argued in the general theory of employment, interest and money, interest rates should always be low. And there's another reason, by the way, they should be low, and that's ecological. If I lend money to the Brazilians to exploit their forests, they have to extract assets from the earth at a much higher rate uh, than the ability of the earth to recreate those assets in order to repay that debt. So there's profound ecological and moral as well as economic reasons why the interest rate should be low. And um, so really, so I've argued, just to answer your question finally, I've argued for a very long time that the Bank of England should create money and they don't even have to print it, um, and funnel that through the government to invest in infrastructure, which will create jobs, which will generate income, which will pay back the Bank of England. Now, the reason why the private sector can't do that at the moment, and, and I'm quite happy for the Bank of England to create, to undertake government spending, which also stimulates the private sector. That's fine. 
um, let both the public and the private sector benefit from this. I'm quite clear that the private sector does, of course, create jobs to see. But the point is, right now, they can't because of their level of indebtedness, of their confidence, because of their fears, because austerity is giving them the real frightens. So this is why the government must undertake, and anyway, there are other reasons, sound political reasons, why anyway, public infrastructure like railways and transport and so on, the, the domain of the public sector, not the private sector. Um, and, you know, by keep the system stable, we manage it, we create the money, we spend it wisely, investing in some projects, we generate income, which is which is wages and salary profits, as well as revenues, that pays back the original loan, and the thing to nicely. It's when you allow the system to be unregulated, so that I can create credit for gambling and speculation, which is what the bank being or when you give me the freedom to charge 15% on a loan, because, gosh, earning 15% on something I created of thin air is a form of wonderful magic. You know, if I go and grow tomatoes, I have to dig the earth and wait for the sun to shine. I have to employ labor, who might be difficult, and go on strike. But if I want to create money, all I do is enter a, money, a number into a computer and charge 15% for it. Wow, wonderful. That's why we have to regulate the rate of interest. We have to manage that system. It's different from growing. Growing money is different from growing tomatoes. And if we do that, we can finance the recovery. We can finance the creation of jobs, which will generate income, which will, will begin the process of, of solving our problem. Okay, so uh, to me, this idea of um, making money out of thin air sounds like magic. But what you're saying is by taking that magic money and investing it into the productive economy and making real things out of it, you turn magic money into real money, which, which gets the economy moving. Um, one of the other things that you, you've done a lot of work on is the idea of ethics in finance and the importance of, of ethics. And how, how, do you, how do you do that? How do you make sure there is some kind of an ethical framework? Presumably you need institutions to make that happen. So what kind of institutions, what kind of regulation, what kind of framework do we need for our, our financial system to make it uh, serve people and planet rather than, than financiers? Well, now you're getting me onto a really big subject, actually, and, and one in which I'm not really very expert. But um, the, the ethical framework actually ought to be set by institutions who whose job it is to set ethical frameworks, and those are, on the whole, the faith organisations. My concern is that almost all of our public institutions have been organisations today obsessed by sex, homosexuality, gay marriage, oh my God, all that stuff. Nobody's talking about usury. Nobody's talking about the exploitation of the poor by the rich. No, they're talking about gay marriage and homosexuality and and so on. It, it incredibly, so that it seems to me that church, at least in my part of the world, has been corrupt and turned into something which is not what it's about. Um, and then there's the whole child abuse stuff, which is, of course, all about sexuality. You know? I mean, please help us. So we, we lack a public faith institution that can set moral standards and that can, that can if you like, give society the, the standards and the, the uh, what's the word I want, you know, the, the, that we could all live up to. This is no longer happening. I mean, there was a time when the church would punish people for being usurist. You know, you, you were expelled from the Catholic Church. Um, your daughter was not ma not allowed to be married in church if you were a user, and you couldn't be buried in sacred soil. And and and, and usurists were very conscious of that and very unhappy about that. They wanted the imprimatur to a perfectly life in the church. The church no longer has that kind of impact on society. We ignore the church on the whole when it comes to matters of money and finance. So there's that problem. There are other institutions that could also set those ethical standards, including the universities and including the economics department. They, too, I'm afraid, uh, lost what Adam Smith had. Um, Adam Smith had a sense 
of, of morals and of the importance of morals in doing business. We've lost that too. So the universities don't give us that. And we, we have lost our way. We've allowed money to corrupt every institution that exists. Um, and I find that really fearful. Um, so to revive those ethic, ethical standards, uh, we need to um, we need to pay attention to the institutions whose job it is to do that. And and cast, I cast to get the church regularly for for this for my high and mighty uh, place, <laughs> which is really a um, very uh, arrogant. Thing. But but I do I do feel it strongly. Um, I come from the countryside. So the church, in some parts, played a very strong role in condemning apartheid mm -hmm. and made it very hard for those in favor of apartheid uh, to defend their position. Um, there was a church, the church, that went along with it. But then they began to, to develop dissidents as well. And then it became very hard for the government uh, to, to maintain that legal and political position in the face of opposition from faith organizations. But I don't see that happening now. We need to reinvigorate churches. We need to reinvigorate our universities. And we need to reinvigorate any of the institutions, charitable and otherwise, that could play this role. Um, but at first of all, we have to recognize that money is corrupted. Almost all of us, you know, the fact that we can have credit cards, we can do as we please, we can go on holidays, we can drowsily, we can gamble and speculate in ways that our uh, forebears wasn't weren't able to do. I think that's uh, we've all got to examine our conferences and the impact that's had on, on us and on our communities. Sorry about that little hobby. No, not at all. It, in fact, it reminds me of the quote from the Latin American priest, and I forget who it was, but it's the one that says, um, uh, something like, when I fed the poor, they called me a saint. When I asked why the poor had no food, they called me a communist. Um, and, and, and there is, there is, a, there is a, a problem of, of institutions. You speak about the church, we're from the trade union movement. We see how the trade unions yeah. could also form that kind of... Uh, we have values as well, solidarity and uh, things like that. And those values are not strong in society anymore. And we need to, we need to find a way to, 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 to do that. Um, we don't have very much longer. You need, to be, you need to be on your way. So I thought... And I'm going to ask you another difficult question, but you, you can give me an easy answer if you don't have the time. We've lost our way. How do we find our way back? Um, we have the policy solutions. Um, the, the things that you've told us are not unusual. We've heard similar things from other economists. Um, it's not yeah. as if you have some completely crazy idea that, that makes no sense and you know, has no evidence base. Um, they're, they're good ideas. It's sensible economics. Um, however, our politicians have lost their way even more than us. They misdiagnose the problem, they're wedded to ideologies uh, which are focused on greed. What can we do as a society, as citizens, as people to, to find our way back to um, a fairer and more sustainable economics? Yeah, I think the first thing is we have to recognize that our political institutions have also been corrupted. Um, in Britain, uh, our parliament does no longer have power. We have, if you like, um, private parliamentary powers. There was a time, not very long ago, when the parliament decided how much money went into the health service, how much money for broadcasting, um, how much money was used for, for public transport. Those decisions are now taken by private organizations. And so parliament is, has been hollowed out if you, on the one hand, and as we know, our politicians are largely in the pockets of the bankers. They have enough money to buy our politicians, both here and in the United States. Um, and, I mean, one of the things that's really hard about the work that I do is that I'm upset that. I mean, I, we don't have, as trade unions or as NGOs or as charities, the kind of resources the banks have to buy a politician. Um, so that's, that's a big problem. I think it may, one of the reasons why that's been allowed to happen is that we as individuals are opted out of the political process. We're disgusted by our politicians on the whole. We find them distasteful, you know, they cheat on their wives, they force their wives to take their points on their uh, 
uh, uh, speeding tickets, that kind of really awful, you know, really, really tough. And so that distaste has kind of distanced us from the political process. And that's exactly what the banks want to happen. I want us to get more political. Uh, whichever party it is that you want to join, fine. But go in there and dirty your hands in the political process. Go and join a party, argue a case, stand up to all the, uh, the sort of bankers, bogey, the bankers people that have uh, that have joined these parties, and and say no, uh, different values, and our parties um, have been, including you know even the conservative parties have values that are above and beyond those of financial interests. So I, I think we've got to get political, we've got to join parties, and we've got to argue a progressive case where we are. I also think we have to join our, our unions, and I'm very happy to see that actually that seems to be happening here in Britain, um, because we have to recognize that we can work as individuals, we have to work collectively with others if we are going to be able to take on the big, powerful financial institutions. So I think that's a really important thing to do. Um, and I want to say this to the unions. Um, in reality, we have more in common industrialists and people who make things with the makers rather than the takers. And the takers are the money men, the finance people. And they have hurt our big corporations as much as they've hurt individuals. When I say this to some of my friends, they say, oh, everybody, all these big corporations are tied in with bankers and with finance interests. That may be so. But there are entrepreneurs out there. There are engineers. People who want to make things, who want to make things work, who want to do things well. I think the unions, the labor should form an alliance with industrialists who, who are in the business of keeping things admittedly into profit. Um, but they want to play a positive role in society, they just want to be gambling and taking money. And we should unite with them against the interests of finance, organize against finance, and say, you have hurt and you have corporations as much as you've robbed individuals of their jobs and so on. And let us work together in a financial system that acts as servant to the economy and not master of the economy. Now, for many trade unions, that's anathema. You know, they don't like the bosses, they want the bosses. And of course, we're going to be fussy about which bosses we talk to. But I do think that alliance of the makers and the workers against the takers is the thing that will give us the leverage, if you like, to tackle the finance sector. But that means we're going to overcome some of our distasteful bosses as well. Um, but and, and persuade them of what's good for them by such an alliance. Anyway, I, that might be pie in the sky, but that's one of my solutions. Thank you, Anne. That's, uh, it's challenging to us and uh, very interesting. Um, thank you for joining us today for, for this discussion. It's been enlightening and it's been very encouraging as well to know that there are people like yourself doing this kind of important work, um, that the policy solutions are out there, that we can, we can find a solution to the crisis that, that we're in and by working together um, there, are, there are solutions. So thank you. Pleasure. Thank you.